Hello, everybody, and welcome to the From Poverty to Progress channel, the channel that is devoted to promoting an awareness and understanding of human progress. My name is Michael Magoon, and I'm the author of the From Poverty to Progress book series. The first book in my book series is entitled From Poverty to Progress, and it explains the origin and causes of modern progress. My second book, which I'm excited to announce is now available on pre-release, is about applying those lessons so how we can keep progress going, both in the United States, Western Europe, and in developing nations. Today, I'm going to continue my series of book reviews on the topics of progress, history, economic growth, and technological innovation. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress by Steven Pinker. Steven Pinker, who you probably heard of, is one of the most well-known thinkers in the world at this time, and he is a professor of psychology at Harvard University. I'm going to start off by a few key quotes by Steven Pinker in his book to let you know what this book is about. At the time of this writing, my country is led by people with a dark vision of the current moment. I will show that this bleak assessment of the state of the world is wrong, and not just a little wrong. Wrong, wrong. Flat Earth wrong. Couldn't be more wrong. This book is my attempt to restate the ideals of the Enlightenment in the language and concepts of the 21st century. The Enlightenment principle that we can apply reason and sympathy to enhance human flourishing may seem obvious, trite, or old-fashioned. I wrote this book because I have come to realize that it is not, more than ever, the ideals of reason, science, humanism, and progress need a wholehearted defense. We take its gifts for granted. I couldn't agree more with that statement. We know that countries can slide back into these primitive conditions, and so we ignore the achievements of the Enlightenment at our peril. The Enlightenment is conventionally placed in the last two-thirds of the 18th century. The era was a cornucopia of ideas, some of them contradictory, but four themes tie them together. Reason, science, humanism, and progress. The thinkers of the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment saw an urgent need for a secular foundation for morality because they were haunted by a historical memory of centuries of religious carnage. With our understanding of the world advanced by science and our circle of sympathy expanded through the reason and cosmopolitanism, humanity can make intellectual and moral progress. Rather than trying to shape human nature, the Enlightenment hope for progress was concentrated on human institutions. So what could we take from this? Well, first of all, Stephen Pinker clearly believes that progress is important, that it exists, and that it originally descends from the Enlightenment. Now, I love this book, but I don't actually agree with Stephen Pinker's argument on the Enlightenment being the actual cause of modern progress. If you want to know what I think was the actual causes of progress, see my video, What Causes Progress. But now let's get back to this book review. Stephen Pinker says, what is progress? You might think that the question is so subjective and culturally relative as to be forever unanswerable. In fact, it's one of the easier questions to answer. Most people agree that life is better than death. Health is better than sickness. Sustenance is better than hunger. Abundance is better than poverty. Peace is better than war. Safety is better than danger. Freedom is better than tyranny. And he goes on and on with more. All these things can't be measured. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Then Stephen Pinker goes on in a chapter where, in a number of chapters, where he goes on to show with quantitative data that there has actually been tremendous progress across, across a wide variety of domains. Life, health, sustenance, environment, peace, safety, terrorism, democracy, equal rights, knowledge, quality of life, and happiness. And I'm going to be doing my own series of videos showing even more evidence on these points that progress does exist. So this leads us to a key takeaway from Steven Pinker's book. Humanity has enjoyed enormous progress over the past few generations. This progress is widespread both geographically and in the breadth of domains. Getting back to the author's quotes, and this is where he starts explaining in much more detail where all this progress comes from. 
It takes nothing away from the Enlightenment thinkers to identify some critical ideas that the human condition and the nature of progress that we know, and they didn't. Those ideas, I suggest, are entropy, evolution, and information. Entro, evo, info. These concepts define the narrative of human progress, the tragedy we were born into, and our means of eking out a better existence. The first piece of wisdom they offer is that misfortune may be no one's fault. A major breakthrough of the scientific revolution, perhaps its biggest breakthrough, was to refute the intuition that the universe is saturated with purpose. And I think this is a really important point, the fact that there are many problems that humanity has, and it's not an individual's fault or the fault of a group of people. So much in politics is about blaming the other side or blaming a group of people. It's simply not true, and it doesn't help us to create a better world. Poverty, too, needs no explanation. In a world governed by entropy and evolution is the default state of humankind. Evolution left us with another burden. Our cognitive, emotional, and moral faculties are adapted to individual survival and reproduction in an archaic environment, not to universal thriving in a modern world. So for all the flaws in human nature, it contains the seeds of its own improvement. As long as it comes up with norms and institutions that channel parochial interests into universal benefits. Among these norms are free speech, nonviolence, cooperation, cosmopolitanism, human rights, and an acknowledgement of human fallibility. And among the institutions are science, education, media, democratic government, international organizations, and markets. Not coincidentally, these are the major brain children of the Enlightenment. The disdain for reason, science, humanism, and progress has a long pedigree in elite intellectual and artistic culture. Left-wing and right-wing political ideologies have themselves become secular religions, providing people with a community of like-minded brethren, a catechism of sacred beliefs, a well-populated demonology, and a beautif... Beati and beatific confidence in the righteousness of their cause. I have to admit, I don't know that word, beatific. <laughs> uh, political ideology undermines reason and science. It scrambles people's judgment, inflames a primitive tribal mindset, and distracts them from a sounder understanding of how to improve the world. And I agree with all of the above wholeheartedly, and I made a whole set of videos which start with why ideologies threaten progress on exactly this point. But it's the idea of progress that sticks most firmly in the craw of many intellectuals. Intellectuals hate progress. Intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. And this is absolutely true. I believe the concept of progress fundamentally undermines the worldview of most, if not all, ideologies, which is exactly why intellectuals hate the concept. It shows that given the correct preconditions, which I discussed in some of my other videos, human societies can self-generate progress. It doesn't come on high from politics or intellectuals or from the government. It comes from society itself. And intellectuals want to feel important. They want to feel like they're the cause. That's why they hate progress. The major enemy of reason in the public sphere today, which is not ignorance, innumerancy, or cognitive biases, but politicization, appears to be on the upswing. I agree on this point 100% as well. I would say more than just politicization, its ideologies are the problem. Yet there is one realm of accomplishment of which we can unabashedly boast before any tribunal of minds, and that is science. Though our ignorance is vast and will always be, our knowledge is astonishing and growing daily. Many intellectuals are enraged by the intrusion of science into the traditional territories of the humanities such as politics, history, and the arts. What then distinguishes science from other exercises of reason? It is these ideals that advocates of science want to export to the rest of the intellectual life. The first is that the world is intelligible. The second ideal is that we must allow the world to tell us whether our ideas about it are correct. A scientist 
degree of belief in a theory depends on its consistency with empirical evidence. Any movement that calls itself scientific but fails to nurture opportunities for the testing of its own beliefs, most obviously when it murders or imprisons the people who disagree with it, is not a scientific movement. Ultimately, the greatest payoff of instilling an appreciation of science is for everyone to think more scientifically. One of the greatest potential contributions of modern science may be a deeper integration with all its academic partners, the humanities. By all accounts, the humanities are in trouble. There is a growing movement called humanism, which promotes a non-supernatural basis for meaning and ethics, good without God. The physical requirements that allow rational agents to exist in the material world are not abstract design specifications. They are implemented in the brain as wants, needs, emotions, pains, and pleasures. That means that food, comfort, curiosity, beauty, stimulation, love, sex, and camaraderie are not shallow indulgences or hedonistic distractions. They are links in the causal chain that allowed minds to come into being. At the same time, evolution guarantees that these desires will work at cross purposes with each other and with those of other people. Much of what we call wisdom consists in balancing the conflicting desires within ourselves, and much of what we call morality and politics consists in balancing the conflicting desires among people. Evolution thus selects for the moral sentiments, sympathy, trust, gratitude, guilt, shame, forgiveness, and righteous anger. With sympathy installed in our psychological makeup, it can be expanded by reason and experience to encompass all sentient beings. A viable moral philosophy for a cosmopolitan world cannot be constructed from layers of intrinsic argumentation or rest on deep metaphysical or religious convictions. It must draw on simple, transparent principles that everyone can understand and agree upon. History confirms that when diverse cultures have to find common ground, they converge towards humanism. So what's a key takeaway we can take from this book? Steven Pinker clearly believes that reason, science, and humanism can all be effective tools at overcoming the irrational and antisocial sides of human nature and promoting progress. Now, I must admit, I'm a little more skeptical than Steven Pinker is on how much we can rely on science and humanism to promoting progress. But overall, I have to say, I really like this book. It came out right when I was writing my first book, and it really uh, was quite amazing to me how similar our books are. And no, I didn't actually read it before I wrote my book. But I think uh, other than the focus on science and humanism, I think there is a great deal of overlap between what we are saying. So what's my overall rating in this book? Well, in terms of the overall scope and what he covers, it's a five. It really covers a wide variety of areas. In terms of theory, I also think it's quite strong. I don't think there's any fundamentally new ideas. In fact, I think Steven Pinker would be the first to say uh, he's just repeating what the Enlightenment said. But I think it still is, uh, he does exactly what he says he wants to do. He updates the ideals of the Enlightenment for the 21st century. In terms of readability, I think it's quite good. It, I think anybody who would be interested in this topic can easily sit down and read it. It's a pretty long book, so you'll have to work quite hard, but I think it will be, you will enjoy the process. My personal ratings, it's a five stars, easy. This is a very important book in the field of progress studies. As I said before, I do have strong disagreements with Steven Pinker on what the causes of progress are and how we move forward. But I see Steven Pinker and his way of thinking as a valuable ally to have and not someone who is in fundamental disagreement. If you would like to see a more detailed review of this book, go to my website, techratchet.com, and type in Enlightenment Now in the search field. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe and like. It really helps the channel to grow. If you'd like more resources, I'd recommend going to my website from PovertyToProgress.com. With a free email subscription, you get free ebook samples, free audio samples, and you can buy discounted ebooks and audiobooks. If you insist on paying full price, you can get ebooks, paperbacks, and hardcovers at Amazon, or if you're a bookstore or a library, you can get them at Ingram Spark. Audiobooks are available at Amazon, 
Audible, and iTunes. If you'd like to know more about books related to this content, I'd recommend going to my other website, which is the techratchet.com. It consists of an online library of over 280 book summaries on the topics of technology, history, economic growth, and progress. And now we're getting on to the exciting part, a free book giveaway of my first book, From Poverty to Progress. If you're a regular listener, you already know the rules. If you don't know the rules, please pause this video and read this description. There's a free book giveaway every week. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you next time.